So uh, one of the things I'm uh, curious about is you, you use press books and you have uh, service for press books. I'm, I'm curious to talk a little bit about uh, the remixing part of open educational resources. I, mm. It just seems like a lot of OER over the years is sort of like, you know, get it, get it out and then sort of run. Yeah. And it's not really very remixable, but I'm, I'm wondering if you have some uh, good stories about uh, things that came into press books and then they migrated mm -hmm. and got broken into pieces and got recombined into some other thing and there was some life of this content after sort of the initial push to get the thing out in the first place. Yeah, that's a really important question um, because it has been a big critique of the open education movement is actually that it's really, in particular, it's, I will point out, that it's mostly um, English language funded projects that are being created and then, you know, supposedly everybody's going to adopt them and translate them and that sort of thing. And it's one way, it's not reciprocal. I mean, we're, our funding doesn't say, find an open textbook from OER Africa and adapt it in your context or translate it or that sort of thing. There's no, ex there's no reciprocal expectation there. So I think that's really important. In the case of BC Campus Pressbooks, yes, absolutely. There are textbooks that were actually um, brought in from, I think, OpenStax, and then they get adapted for a Canadian context. That actually does happen. Um, there are, especially in the area, I know, because we, we use an English um, writing open textbook, and it had to be adapted quite a bit to um, meet the level of our students, because our students are very much, um, they come in pretty challenged around English and English writing. So I think there's some very clear examples of, um, especially with open textbooks, of that remixing. Um, maybe because it's a little easier to get your head around too. You know, you have a Word document that you can take and a faculty member can use, mix it up and, you know, it's just sort of easier maybe. It's, it's um, conceptually I think it's different than other open education resources where the remixing thing is like, you know, remixing video. It's, I think it's a little bit more difficult or remixing audio. It requires different skills, it requires different capacity. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Mervyn, and um, we run a, a quite a large instance of Sakai in Africa, probably the largest, uh, 400,000 students. Oh, wow. But uh, my, my question is the following. So I, I hear the, the open source uh, view and argument. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my question is that if you look at the open source uh, paradigm, and, and, I look, and I compare that to the vendor-driven uh, paradigm, we have students that are, have higher expectations. We have students that, are, that want us to respond quicker, faster, mm -hmm. to their demands of online, anywhere, everywhere. And, and my question to you is, have you considered those two areas where the open source paradigm seems to be an innovation um, or in D space, but if I look at the vendor space, it gives you the quality of service, it gives you the rapid response, it gives you the guarantees mm -hmm. that open source just doesn't seem to want to give us. Mm -hmm. And how do you then, as a large institution, kind of start to deal with that issue? Because if I look at the technology roadmaps built into open source, it doesn't have the future that allow us as an institution to kind of look to. Where if I look at the vendor spaces, the vendor spaces are just so much more aggressive to help us kind of deliver on the future roadmaps, help us respond to what the students require, help us to build out scale. And so unless you're kind of going to own the open source space as an ICT department within a higher education university, you actually feel grappling with actually staying behind the curve. So maybe just, uh, just maybe have you thought about those two for me, because that's kind of our dilemma. Uh, at the moment. We're sitting with an open source platform, but we're really 20 years behind because oh. we haven't managed to keep up right. with what's happening globally and what's happening with, within the space. And mm -hmm. so we can, just your views, please. Thank you. Well, I guess, I mean, I guess I see that also with vendor products too. I mean, we, we still use Blackboard um, mainly because we had someone who negotiated a ridiculously cheap license that makes it still the more viable option. So I see that I see also that argument with vendor software as well. And quite honestly, you know, I'm kind of at that point where I think if it does 80% of what we need and it's open source, it's better than the risks that come with, you know, as an administrator, the risks that come with some of these vendor products, which is here today, gone tomorrow. That's happened. 
Um, it's the, the data monetization and the, the privacy laws. And certainly Canada hasn't kept up with privacy laws enough to sort of compete with what Amazon's doing right now. So I feel like, you know, maybe there's going to be an awkward stage, but I, I guess I, I'm hopeful in the fact that open source is really, you know, there's, it's the power of the community and the, the power of numbers that I, and the transparency. So I guess maybe I'm naively ho hopeful and we're certainly, there's nothing in Canada that is at the scale of what you're saying, 400,000 students. We do not have a single institution in Canada that has that kind of scale. So I think you have to take what I'm saying with a grain of salt because my world is very much not 400,000 students. There was a question here, actually. Um, is there still a question? Uh, yeah, so... Um Mm -hmm. um, are there uh, efforts to go beyond uh, British Columbia and oh, yeah. you know, Canadian-wide? Uh, yeah. yeah this there are, yes, actually, there's, I know there's some folks here from Ontario. So Ontario, actually, which is a much larger province with way more money um, <laughs> and bigger population and many more institutions. Um, so there's an eCampus Ontario version now. Basically, the executive director of BC Campus moved to Ontario and started it there. Um, so, oh, yeah, it's a, and there's a lot of collaboration happening. Um, it allows for us to not duplicate efforts when we're trying to fill gaps, for example, in the trades. There's not a lot of trades textbooks. Um, so that's an area of focus right now. So, and certainly in the U.S., there's many initiatives. I think Ohio State has one. Um, Spark is leading a lot in the U.S. There's, there's quite a few. They seem to be, I think, maybe because of the population and size of the U.S., that they're more siloed, perhaps, than in Canada, where, you know, quite frankly, we, we have to work together. When we, there's just no other way. <laughs> Otherwise, nothing would ever happen. So, yeah, lots of initiatives. And of course, that's without talking about the many open courseware initiatives that, you know, all around the world. Um, I look to Delft University, for example. Um, OER Africa has some great initiatives. I mean, they're, they're all over the place, for sure. Especially if you're willing to look in other languages, um, there's some really amazing stuff. And, and some of this is happening at, a, like, really at an amazing scale. Like, continuing um, medical health professionals have a uh, service called Avastus, which is basically an incredible platform for um, health professionals and it you know it actually calculate it, it actually is authenticated so they have sort of they sort of have this you know system of recording their continuing education but it's for the entire country and it's just incredible if you you see just how many students are taking some of these mini modules and that sort of thing so there's some really interesting things you know outside of north america as well But interestingly enough, we, we rarely talk about the infrastructure underneath it. It's, um, we like to talk about the stuff on the top, the teaching and learning, but we don't really get into talking about the enabling factors of which our research shows is open, open ed tech is actually a huge enabling factor. It's one of the top three. Any other questions? Is there more time? Or? Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of complementary activity, and I, I feel, um, you know, I feel, I feel like it would be nice if the two could be bridged a bit more. And I think partly one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about the importance of open ed tech infrastructure is that, you know, when I say that in my context, it is a contentious point because people really don't want to talk about the tech, and they don't believe that to do open education practices, you actually have to have open ed tech infrastructure. But I'm at the point where I think the two are completely incompatible without. So certainly bridging open education communities with um, Aperio, um, maybe there's an opportunity at conferences like this to um, have, a st have a stream, um, but, you know, at OER in the UK, having, um, you know, more discussion about open ed tech and um, helping others um, discover what Aperio actually is. Um, and I, like I said in my presentation, I really feel like the models that have been successful, that have been in existence for a long time, like um, ASAP Portail and 
um, you know, what France has done completely with their whole ecosystem of open. I mean, it's incredible. It's, it's really um, something to bring back to leadership and say, this is actually a thing. It's not a nice to have, um, you know, or a little pilot over here. So I think that's incredibly profound. what you might call the, the last mile of software delivery. Um, and it's an area where vendors often excel over open source, which is to say, sorry, service, support, um, legal liability, all of this bundle of things that the yeah. vendor sort of takes on. When it comes time to kind of selling open source to an administrator, how do you manage that conversation and, mm -hmm. and talk about those issues? Well, WordPress was a battle at our institution. Honestly, it, it had to, we actually, it is a big problem. I mean, for the purposes of this um, presentation, we actually had a big CIO conference recently in BC. It brings together all the IT people. And I actually had someone there on the ground doing a little survey asking, you know, what, like, what, what is it about, you know, will open source be an important part of IT strategy in the next five years? And of course, Everybody except the one CIO who responded to the survey said, yes, absolutely, this is really important. But the CIO was like, absolutely, no way, no, never. So I do live that. Um, and honestly, I don't know. Like, I'm trying to look at it from a systems perspective. Like, where does, it, where does the conversation start and where does it have to get to? And certainly one of those mechanisms is the procurement process. Um, certainly one of the mechanisms we had to get WordPress was you know, UBC, which is a large, well-funded institution, had an amazing um, WordPress um, integration with so many things, and um, they had 1.5 FTEs supporting like something like 50,000 50, WordPress um, sites at UBC. So it was really, you were able to kind of talk a little bit about the economies of scale, um, demonstrate using UBC that this was possible, um, and that sort of thing. But it's a constant battle, honestly, it's, which is one of the reasons why we created OpenETC, because two of us used to work at UBC. We went to smaller institutions, and we went, oh, this is different. Like, we're not going to get, we're not going to be able to submit a ticket here and get our media wiki tomorrow. <laughs> um, so it was an attempt to sort of solve that problem, because quite honestly, we are the majority. And um, it's still, I mean, it's still early stages, but I think going outside of the institute, creating these para-institutional structures in the public system where possible. Um, we do align with BC Campus as well. They're, they're, they're not an official partner for political reasons, but um, certainly Clinton Lalonde has been part of our activities. So we're exploring that. It's really, it's really tough. And on top of all, I'm not an IT person. So it's a bit of a different battle as well. I think that probably takes us to the time. We've got maybe time for one more, but I don't know. Thank you. So much. Thank you.